Monday 11th of March. And here on your Continental Totally Bulletin show, we're shooting the breeze with James Horncastle. Hello, Jimbo. Alvaro Romeo. Hola, James. And uh, Julien Laurent. Bonjour. Oui. Rafa. Rafa will be a long... Where's Rafa? He's in Czech's Notes, Venice. Wow, nice. Czech's Notes, Venice. Yeah. Nice. He loves going to Italy, Rafa. Yeah, he's yeah. really Italian at heart. Hmm. So that'll be nice. Uh, but he will be a long later. Actually, I'm going to record something with him and then producer Charlie's going to drop it in. But we'll <laughs> pretend it all happens part yeah. of the show. But listen, I can tell you. Anyway, yeah, he's chosen to begin what is a huge week on the continent in uh, the, the city of... What's it? It must have an epithet, city of... Uh, what is it, Venice? I mean, the, the Lagunas, aren't they? The Lagunari. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Amsterdam is the Venice of the north. I guess it's the Amsterdam of the south. Though. Nice. <laughs> the St. Petersburg of the west. Perhaps. <laughs> Perhaps so. Anyway, that's where he yeah. is. Uh, but, uh, yeah, look forward to catching up with uh, him. Big week, though, Jules. Yeah. A big weekend as well. Have you got a moment for us, perhaps? I do. James, Sunday, where Lille were two goals down against Rennes mm. at home after doing really well in Europe on Thursday last week. And who saved the day? Jonathan David, who's been just absolutely amazing in 2024, one of the best strikers in Europe. Super clinical, scored two goals again. He's on 17 in his last 17 now. Wow. And... Some would say cynically, maybe at the right time oh. to leave the club in the summer. Well, again, are we going to have that again? No, again. I think this was always going to be the most likely summer, more than even last summer okay. or even January. But after he had a bit of a patchy form in the first half of the season, mm. now to pick up the form like that to do so well, especially for some of the Italian clubs who mm. are quite keen. Yeah, but all Lille players go to AC Milan. <laughs> yeah, somehow. So <laughs> maybe it's there. And for. The money that Lille would get for him, which again is a big part of their business plan, is good for him to be so, so good at this time of the season. What a lovely what about PSG? football moment of the week. Yeah. Jules, what about PSG? Obviously, you know, I mean, they've got Gonzalo Ramos, Rando Colomuani, yeah. Mbappé's How many more number nines do you want? Like, how no, many but more? I'm just saying, Luis Campos presumably yeah, signed Jonathan David. No, we, we need to spend the money in other positions. So okay. I leave it to Milan or, you know, maybe Napoli if Ozyman goes. I mm. think it'd be a very good replacement. Or like, you know, a few options there, I think. Very nice. Alvaro, what tickled your fancy this weekend? Well, there is a good moment of the week. Um, it's uh, Cadiz beating Atletico de Madrid because uh, Cadiz hadn't won a football game since the 1st of September. And because they were in the bottom three of the table, they needed the win and what a way of getting it against Atletico de Madrid, who are playing against Inter, by the way, this week. But uh, with a brace from Juanmi, mm. a footballer who has traveled the world a little bit. And I think that, that is the moment of the weekend because, you know, uh, Cadiz needed it and it was a defeat that looks very bad on Simeone and Atletico. All I need is Juanmi. One me, yeah. <laughs> one me, two goals. Yeah. A double whammy. <laughs> double whammy. <laughs> ah. Oh, brilliant. No, oh, all God. right. James, your moment of the week. Probably that double whammy, James. <laughs> <laughs> That's your best line in a while. I think so, yeah. No, let's go down to Lecce, shall we? And oh. uh, see a coach who's been sacked for headbutting an opponent. A lot of jokes in the Italian media this morning that uh, Zinedine Zidane will have a new job. <laughs> <laughs> it is the new coach of Lecce because there were echoes of Zidane's headbutt on Marco Materazzi when Lecce's then coach, uh, Roberto Deversa, uh, went on the pitch at full time. And he explained his actions afterwards. He went on the pitch to ensure that his own players would not get into any fights, which would <laughs> lead to them being sent off and being suspended for next weekend's game only for him to headbutt uh, Verona's striker, Thomas Henry. Um, Thomas Henry, he scored more goals than Thierry Henry in Serie right, yeah. mm. um, no A. Who, when he was first signed for Venezia, um, provoked his own manager, Paolo Zanetti at the time, to sort of have a, a bit of an altercation on the sideline. So Thomas Henry seems to do this. But yeah, Roberto De Versa plants his head, stag style, into, uh, into Thomas Henry's chest. And he apologized afterwards. But I've never seen this before. Lecce put out a statement strongly condemning their own coach mm. before then sacking him 24 hours later. Yeah. 
So, yeah, I've never seen anything like that, apart from maybe when Delio Bound Rossi... Delio Rossi, I was going to okay, say. Okay, well, I was going to say Delio, Delio Rossi, Rossi with Adam Leitch. Leitch. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, that was extraordinary. Which was, that was that his was, own player. Yeah. He went to his own bench and struck his own <laughs> yes. player repeatedly about yeah. the face. But the, 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 the example I was thinking was the... Uh, the Calcio and Culo. Uh, yeah, the, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Silvio Baldini, who was, it was Catania and yeah. Mimo Di Carlo. Ah. and kicked him up the backside. I, I guess the next the step line. is Marcelo Bielsa, just uh, getting angry at somebody uh, mm. who was uh, doing the works for Athletic Club Bilbao facilities. He got angry at King, uh, the thing got heated, and after that he called the police to report himself for having oh, hit so that Bielsa. man. Yeah, no, that is so very Bielsa. Marcelo Bielsa. Yeah. Very, yeah. <laughs> and, and produced their report for them as well. Yeah, pretty well. much. <laughs> A very detailed, he scouted, <laughs> detailed, detailed scouting report. He scouted the whole thing. <laughs> CSI, Bill Bow. <laughs> Extraordinary. Expected punch. Wow. Wow, that was a, a broad range of moments of the week. Of course, we'll have Rafa's later. Maybe it'll be restaurant based. We can only It'll hope. surely be, yeah. Mm. Right now, let's talk about Europe. Last week in Europe, we had the second legs of the first set of last 16 ties, and uh, PSG went through fine. No, where. Really? La Real, Bayern as well, at home to Lazio. Real just about mm. at home to RB Leipzig. And of course, Man City got past Copenhagen with that too many issues. This week, though, big names will tumble. <laughs> will it be on Tuesday, Barcelona or Napoli as they meet in the Catalan capital with the scoreline after the first leg 1-1? Will it be Arsenal trailing by a goal, of course, as they host Porto that same night at the Emirates. Or Wednesday, will Atleti manage to come back from a goal down and break Horncastle's heart and put into outer? Or will this be the end of the road for Simeone's stuttering side? And who goes through between Dortmund and PSV? Oof. Wow. Wow. Questions. Wow. So that's 1 1. 1 1 from the first leg. Is it? Okay. Mm. Thursday as well. There's loads of stuff which we'll get onto later. The Thursday stuff. But reading that, I mean, it's two big Italo-Hispanic clashes that dominate attention, I think, probably. Napoli at Barcelona, call that if you dare. It's going to be really good, uh, and it's going to be a really good week in general. I think that uh, Napoli can think that they have a chance of beating Barcelona in Montjuic, even though Barcelona comes as a slightly favourite because they are playing at home. Mm -hmm. Slightly, slightly. Mm. Uh, but are they playing at home, Alvaro? <laughs> <laughs> Look, that's a good point because uh, this season, their home form, if you call it home, it's been pretty bad mm. um, because, uh, you know, uh, many season ticket holders didn't want to make the distance uh, go to Montjuic to watch the games over there. Well, how far is it? Uh, it's, it's up the I, hill, I it? guess it's up the hill <laughs> to start <laughs> with. You, you have, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, that makes a difference, I guess. And if your routines are, I go to the Camp Nou because it's five or ten minutes away from home and suddenly that gets changed, maybe you cannot attend so many games. I don't know. But many supporters didn't feel like enthusiastic about going to Montjuic and therefore the attendances have been a little bit poor. But I think that Barcelona is getting into this game with the obligation to win because mm. uh, many people from uh, Laporta's uh, board of directors have spoken about uh, qualifying for Champions League quarterfinal as an obligation just to meet some financial minimums that Barcelona has to meet with themselves. Mm. Uh, and yeah, this game is key for them. OK, arguably they were the better side in the first leg in Naples. In the first, the first half. half yeah. in, in the, the first, first half. half. Okay. But they didn't first capitalize. A good Barcelona would have. Napoli did capitalize. They're one shot on target. Since then, they've been on a bit of a mini revival. Although they only drew this weekend with Torino. Lovely goal from Cavara. Nice to see that. Yeah, Kavar, who's in good form again, mm. has been uh, revitalized. They're talking about the uh, La Cura Calzona. Ah, nice. The Calzona cure. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Has been on because I think he's scored in his last three games. Mm. And yeah, he's sparkling. And Aussie men, to be honest, has also scored four in five on the Calzona, including that hat trick against uh, Sassuolo in the 6 1 game at the beginning of last week. So. Napoli are scoring goals again. The only problem that they've got, I say the only, they've got a few, um, is that they've conceded in every game that Calzona has been in charge. And yeah, I think they need to start keeping clean sheets again. Uh, this is, you say it's an obligation for Barcelona to win. Napoli's season basically comes down to um, Tuesday night because they're not going to get in the Champions League next year. Um, they're out of the cup. They've got nothing to play for, really, other than this competition. So... They have to give their all in it. Um, they could get into the club, what is it, the Club, club World, World Cup? Yeah. <laughs> but the expanded version, 2025. Yeah, which De Laurentiis has given the impression he doesn't want to be part of. Oh. You know, he, there was 
after that FT Business conference, um, there Which was some FT reports. Business conference? Uh, last week, he was a keynote speaker, mm. and he was asked about the Club World Cup, and he he kind of intimated that the club may take legal action against Juventus for, for obliging Napoli to participate oh. if they qualify, which they they will qualify if they go through into the quarterfinals. Um, but I also think I think the players maybe have bonuses linked to qualification for the mm. Club World Cup as well. So it's it's all a bit messy, as with everything okay. um, De Laurentiis does. All right. But one more with Torino this weekend. They had a bunch of other chances. They looked... They played well. Yeah. Barcelona, since that 1-1 draw in the first leg, have seen De Jong and Pedri yeah. joining Gavi and the many others on their injury list. Yeah, and this is a problem because in Barcelona midfield will have to play with the footballers that in uh, perfect conditions they would have never played in a game of this calibre. Uh, I think that Fermin or Christensen playing as a holding midfielder is something that we wouldn't have seen. Uh, had Pedri, De Jong and Gabi been available. But uh, James was referring to Napoli's obligation, not obligation, but uh, for Napoli the season could be too long if they get knocked out of the Champions League right now because they've got nothing or very little to play for in Serie A. But what about Barcelona? Because yes, Barcelona are going to qualify for another Champions League season, but they are very far away from Real Madrid. So they are out of the cup. And if they lose this game, the season is going to be tremendously long for them because April and May, they're going to be excruciating because Real Madrid is going to win the La Liga title. That's pretty much given unless Girona does something miraculous. And, um, you know, uh, I think that uh, the conversation is going to shift from Xavi leaving to who are we going to sign, who is going to be the next manager. And this conversation, having it in the middle of April, is not healthy. It's mm -hmm. not good for a team of, like Barcelona. Yeah, they can really lose their way. Uh, well, they can lose their way. Then the conversation about their financial struggles will come back. Mm. Uh, I have to remind everyone that uh, Barcelona is paying in salaries around 400 million mm. and their salary cap right now is 200 million. Oh. So they have to keep on reducing this. Otherwise, if they sign players, uh, they will find it very difficult to register them. It's the same story. It's been cyclical for three or four years already. So Barcelona has to win this game. So uh, in England, those kind of numbers would mean a swift visit from the PSR police. <laughs> uh, I understood that La Liga had pretty tough regulations about their own club's uh, finances. So uh, Barca not in line for some kind of swift points penalty? No, I don't think so. Oh. Uh, because this is La Liga telling them that they cannot spend this money in oh. salaries because they don't uh, have a certain revenue yeah, and they have money. this debt. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, Barcelona can pay that, but... Uh, La Liga salary cap is like this. Uh, Real Madrid has uh, the potential to pay up to 700 million in salaries, and mm. Barcelona has the potential to pay up to 200 according to La Liga rules. Okay, but they're so paying 400. They are paying 400 right so now, despite the having lost. The, it's they can't register players. Yeah, you can't ah, sign okay, anyone. Fine. Yeah, despite having lost Messi, Suarez, yeah. Griezmann, and so on. Yeah. So the problem with Barcelona is going to be that if they want to sign a player, number one. Uh, they don't have a lot of money to sign. Mm. Number two, that uh, for them to sign, they will have to offload players and then use only the 25% of that money they gain right. to sign. And then the, can they register them or not? It's going to be the same thing again. Crikey. Okay. Ooh, the other uh, Italo-Hispanic clash uh, this week is on the Wednesday and it's Atletico Madrid against Inter. Atleti are 1-0 down from the first leg. Now, Inter this weekend had their 13th <laughs> straight victory. 1-0 against Inform. Bologna, who themselves had won six in a row before this. Atleti this weekend, Alvaro, not so much. Uh, no, no, Atleti was hopeful. Uh, can I say something astonishing about Inter that I, I, I watched the other day? We're all they sitting down. They, 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 no, <laughs> they haven't considered any goal in Serie A after the 76th minute. Oh. I saw the graphic the other day uh, when I was watching the game and I mm. couldn't believe it. How many, how many weeks have they played already in Serie A? 28? Yeah, well, 28. so uh, Jan Sommer, in keeping that clean sheep... Uh, clean sheep, I said. Um, difficult to keep clean, considering yeah. the uh, woolen. Yeah. Anyway, um, <laughs> Jan Sommer, he matched the single-season record for clean sheets by an Inter goalkeeper, set by Julio Cesar mm. when they won the treble, and Samir Handanovic, I think, when they won the league under Conte. And yet there are still 10 games to go. They can break a lot of records, no? They can break a yeah. lot of records. They've already got more points after 28 games than they did after the entirety of last season in Serie A, which Why? shows you the kind of pace that they are on. They've won every single game uh, in 2024. They should have won the first leg by a bigger margin. That's the regret. They should have been two, three uh, goals up going into this game. Tie should be over. 
The goal scorer, Mark Iron Alterich, I know people will be very disappointed to learn this. He picked up an injury when he came on um, at the weekend and so will not be available to miss chances like the two that preceded his goal. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> but Marcus Tiram did come back and start mm. against Bologna. He was then taken off after a, a, an hour. Chalinolu came back, started, was taken off after an hour. And a few players rested, like Di yeah. on the bench, Lautaro on the bench. It was all of that. quite a complicated second half for Inter in, in Bologna. Bologna showed why they are where they are uh, in the top four because I think they were the first team ever, or at least the first team since Optus started collecting stats, to limit Inter to zero shots of any kind in the second half. Mm. Completely neutralized Inter, hemmed them back, and some people said, okay, Inter were basically saying that we're going to just sit back in our own penalty area and defend because we know we can do this. We've kept, kept all those clean sheets that Alvaro was talking about. But Simone Inzaghi, quite honestly, after the game said that wasn't really how we wanted to play. It was because Bologna forced us to do that. But I'm quite curious. I mean, it would be a, it would be a real sucker punch for Inter to, to lose, I think, in Madrid. Um, considering this run that they've been on. Considering uh, Atleti didn't manage a single shot on target themselves yeah. in the game at San Siro. Yeah. Because Simeone, Simeone that day played with Marcos Llorente as a number right. nine, uh, because Marcos Llorente three days or four days before that had scored a brace against Las Palmas. Right. And that was very misleading for, for everyone because Antoine Griezmann was getting the ball there uh, at San Siro and he got nothing or nobody, sorry, to pass the ball to. Is Griezmann back for Tuesday? For yeah. Wednesday? Yeah. He should be. Yeah. He, he should be. He started training on uh, Friday with the team, with the mm. group, and yeah, yeah, he should be back. Okay. Wow. Inter, as I say, 13 straight wins. Only the third time in their history, this is a remarkable statistic too, that they've won 10 league matches in a row. Mm -hmm. Two of those have come during Inzaghi's tenure. Yeah. When you think of some of the managers who pass through their storied doors, Simone Inzaghi, Thiago Motta gets a lot of press as being one of the hot young managers in, in Europe, mentioned in connection with some of the big vacancies. Nobody talks about Simone Inzaghi that way. Well, remember this He's time older, last though, year. Yeah, and more experience. Yeah, so. but even... even yeah, but even yeah. more attractive, I would say. But I, I, I agree with your point because when uh, Allegri was winning titles with Juve, mm. he was always that rumored man to be the next Arsenal manager, for Man example. Man 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 you, hey, we haven't spoken about Inzaghi like this. I don't think anyone's yeah, 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 talked yeah. about Simone Inzaghi. No, no, I no, think no. He, d he presents himself in such a kind of nondescript way, you know? I think that's beginning to change, though, because it was clear to everyone who watched that Atletico game that they were on a different level to Atletico. And also, tactically, they are doing some really interesting stuff, particularly with their centre-backs. Often playing in midfield um, or, I mean, this was something that was fetishized over in the Italian media over the last 48 hours was Inzaghi loves these goals, which he calls quinto su quinto, which is wing back to wing back. And in December, he was propositioned by one of the pundits on Italian TV. Okay, that's great, Simone. Next, you should try. Center half, center half, center, 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 half, center half. That's exactly what happened, and that's ex that's exactly what happened. And so, uh, there are lots of things that are, people are saying. Okay, this is more than just into having a good squad of players. This is you're actually seeing a manager putting ridiculous kind of layers tactically onto this team. Um, and I've certainly seen the optic finally in the last month or whatever that there are lots of tactics nerds doing YouTube videos about Inter. Um, which I think they perhaps should have been doing already last year. But it seems that after all the hype that I've given them yeah. on this show. On, yeah. for, on, on any show, really. On any yeah. show. <laughs> yeah. The Cooking world is shows, waking up. Cooking shows, gardening shows. <laughs> <laughs> at home. Perfect time for them to get knocked out, really. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. them badly. Yeah. Yeah. But about Atletico, I have to say something. That in 2024, they've been very poor. Uh, they played a lot of football as well. I think that they, they've been tired at some point. In midfield, no one seems to have the command of anything. Coque, Saul, De Paul. De Paul was very poor in Milan, to the point that he gave away one chance to Marcus Turam, I remember. But if Atletico scores a goal, a new belief will be born at Civitas Metropolitano, and Inter should be worried of that as well, because Atletico at home only lost one game last year. So, you know... In the last year? In the la no, last year, in 2023, oh, okay, right. they only lost one game at home. So, hmm. at the end of the day, they know how to do a job over there. If um, we only look at the home uh, record this season, Atletico will be topping the league. 
The best so, in the league, yeah, 40 points out of 42. Yeah, and the Civitas, they are pretty decent. So I think that Inter is better, yes, of course. But Atletico can be dangerous at home. Wow. All right, that's coming up on Wednesday. As is Dortmund PSV, which we'll be talking about later on with Rafa. Tuesday, meanwhile, the other game is Arsenal-Porto. Derby of the two sides who have suffered the most eliminations at the last 16 of the Champions League in the competition's history. Arsenal with nine. They've gone out in the last seven, of course. Porto with eight. Who's going to be adding to their tally here? I think Arsenal can can do it, really. Yeah. The you were there, weren't you, at the first leg? Tools. I wasn't there the first leg no. in Porto. No, I wasn't, oh. but we were watching on television. Ah, right. That that late leg goal from Galeno, who has been what? on fire since, by the yeah. way. Uh, Porto have scored eight goals in the last two league games against Benfica and Portimonens at the weekend. Maybe the difference maker. However, I still think that as much as as good as Porto could be to just lock a game in, if you see what I mean, like yeah. defensively, just yeah. not make anything happen. Like we saw in the first leg, basically stopping all sorts of rhythm and tempo and right. and momentum from Arsenal. I still think that at the Emirates, Arsenal should have enough to qualify. But well, it would be a really good game. All of their Champions League home games in this season, Arsenal, they've won. They kept clean sheets in all of them. Aggregate scored 12-0. Worth pointing out that Porto have been on a bit of a run since that yeah. 1-0 win over the Gunners. Must That's have a 5-0 over Benfica. Yeah. Over Benfica. And then 3-0 at the yeah, weekend over Porto, Porto Menense. Menense. Yeah, yeah, Nico so. Gonzalez is playing very well. No? Mm. Um, he left Barcelona, uh, Pastors New, Portugal, and he found finally his, uh, his own rhythm over there. OK. Without Gabriel Martinelli, Arsenal struggled a little bit at the weekend against Brentford. Yeah, yeah I think Trossard brings something different. Hmm. I think there's a case to make for Rhys Nelson, who's obviously not as good as Martinelli or even Trossard, but at least has the pace which I think Arsenal will need on that side. You can also put Gabriel Jesus as a left wing on the left wing, for example, or and make him come inside a lot with Kai Havertz as a nine. There's a lot of things that I think Arteta can do to make sure that this game has the intensity that Arsenal will need. If Porto manage again to cut all that kind of intensity, whether they make fouls or you know what, there's different ways of doing it, then it'd be more difficult for Arsenal. But I wouldn't be surprised if Gabriel Jesus starts as a left wing back. I think this goes to extra time. Wing, yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, everybody. Oh. The horn has <laughs> the hot sounded. take. Yeah. <laughs> I do, because I remember last year, around the 16, Inter played them and it was very tight. Inter won the home game and it was nil-nil at the Dragao. So, you know, I think this this team is very streetwise, Porto. I think they can really disrupt Arsenal in a quite unpleasant way. And I don't know. I've, I've seen this team uh, continually frustrate um Italian sides over the years. Inter were the first one to knock them out after Porto had basically knocked out Juve, knocked out Roma, knocked Milan out of the Champions League group stages. So Porto qualified for the Europa League. I think in this country, we all have Porto's performances against Liverpool kind of stuck in our mind and how Liverpool made such Destroyed light work them, of them. Yeah, yeah they've never won an away game. They don't need to win this, but they've no. never won an away game in England. Yeah. Porto will be playing on the fact that this is the 20th anniversary of them winning this competition on the Jose, that famous night at Old Trafford. Yeah. Mm. Could wow. they have a... F- <laughs> Jose was in Saudi um, uh, yeah. over the weekend. Yeah, a lot over the weekend. Yeah. Everywhere he was. Yeah. But um, so I, you know, I, th- I, 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 I see your stats about Arsenal's home form. And I raise The number you. of goals. And, but I'm raising you this, James. Uh, All right. Finish that Porto has improved a lot over the last month uh, because a month ago there were there, there was criticism uh, towards uh, Conceição and now there's not uh, after beating Benfica 5-0 uh, because Conceição basically has always won one league every two in Portugal mm. and this season for the first time I think that he's not going to win the league so it's going to be two seasons without winning the league for Porto but beating Benfica 5-0 is a statement as well I think that if Porto has the ability to make you play in their terms and this is something that they did at Dragao but uh, but because they didn't attack if they attack which they won't do yeah. tomorrow against Benfica they attacked at the weekend they attacked right they won't attack on Tuesday they don't need to so they yeah. will be they play a similar game to the first leg that's it you know my opinion about Arsenal I, I think you that don't they rate are, them I think that they are Botless. brilliant no no oh I yeah think, okay I, no 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 no, no. Top, I, yeah. top of the league totally yeah it's the leader of the Premier League best goal mm. difference I mean you are there for a reason I think that they are very good and uh, maybe they are about to get something big Crikey. All right, that's enough Champions League stuff because there's League 1 chat to be had. That's next. All right, Jules. How come we're doing Liga again 
Top. There's something. Is there something it's wrong not really with you? Top, is it? Well, kind of <laughs> top of the leagues. Well, Before this Serie, abuse I mean, of that we keep, notion. We keep Serie A at the end so we could do 25 minutes. But even like before La Liga, I'm, I'm loving it. I love your uh, new love for Liga. Well, it was so angry. exciting. Last, it was very exciting. Week. I enjoyed it. Uh, what have we got this time? Oh, Kylian Mbappé starting on the bench for PSG as they picked up their third draw in a row. But it doesn't matter because their lead at the top still gets extended because their Somehow. nearest rivals, Brest, lost to Lens. Yeah, which was a brilliant game. Uh, Lens against Brest. Okay, and that he... sounds painful. <laughs> it's like <laughs> <laughs> the jousting classico. Yeah, exa- I was waiting for something. <laughs> it was good, but you're right. PSG, even without winning, still extend the lead to 10 points. And Mbappé on the bench, he's not even used anymore, to be fair. I mean, we are used to it. We ask, he looked uh, pretty relaxed. He w- I think yeah. he knew it as well. Yeah. On Friday, we asked Luis Enrique in his press conference and he said it will depend on the sun. Oh. If oh. it's sunny and hot, it might start. If it's not, it might be on the bench. Okay. Which is a BS answer completely. Uh, what does and Killian that- make of that? Because it makes him sound um, like he doesn't like playing in cold weather. It's the sort of thing that would get associated with... I think you take it too seriously. Okay. I don't think Killian did. Should have gone with but his there's horoscopes. A sense, there's a It'll depend bit. What, it's, what it says in his horoscope. On. <laughs> yeah, I guess yeah. so. Yeah. With, I mean, Raymond Domenech could, oui. could tip with Enrique. I, I saw I Philippe could... Mexis. Sorry, sorry Thursday. Yeah, Philippe, yeah. I saw Philippe Mexis mm. outside the... Um, right. Uh, Stadio Olimpico. You can't miss uh, him. Considering you can't the size miss him. Of it, the size of him. Still, he got very big. Oh yeah. Re- really? What what kind of big? Like, did he go to the gym too much, or did he eat too much? No. Uh, There's the, a bit of both. I think the, the carbonara. Yeah. I think is been good to him. Now, no? Carbonara has been good to him. Yeah. <laughs> Still, <laughs> some players like that, you know, post career. <laughs> Still, the player who had one of the weirdest injuries that I've ever come across. Also, one of the finest goals at San Oh the yes. Ho- the ah, yeah. yeah. But you know, course. injured himself on a sun lounger. Yeah. Did he? Yeah, uh, injured. I think his cornea in his yeah, eye, or something like wrong. that. Yeah. Nothing. Not like, like, um, I mean, the, the color of his Sebastian skin is always. Frey injured himself diving into a swimming pool. <laughs> <laughs> there was no water in it. <laughs> oh my god! Oh, my Goalkeepers god. are different. Hey, can you Fares, remember that? <laughs> oh yeah, the, he yeah. missed a World Cup just I'm because not, he tried to stop with his foot. I'm yeah, not yeah. too convinced about this. Uh, that's the official version. Yeah. yeah. Oh, what do you think? He tried, but okay. you, you know what happened, no? Maybe no, our listeners are too are too too young and don't yeah, know I this. He, 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 <laughs> <laughs> of course, you, Jimbo. That's why I'm telling you. Before World Cup 2002, he was yeah. going to be the starting goalkeeper for Spain. Right. And um, in his hotel hotel room, oh. he, he was having a shower. This is what he says. Yes. A bottle of cologne was about to fall on the shower. He put yes. his foot to stop it, and he cut his foot. Oh, okay. That's right. why he missed World Cup 2002. Right. That's his version of the story. Jules mm-hmm. has another version, but, you know. Hmm. <laughs> anyway, so... Um, <laughs> Uh, we were talking about Ligue 1, Jules. Yeah, but and um, Kylian. No, I was oh, going to no, say but about you were talking about Philip Mexes. Why? Yeah, because you were talking about Dominic. Mm. Oh yeah, horoscopes. Yeah, yeah. and Mexes was the victim. Was oh, the victim they, of it? Was, yeah, yes. of course. Right. Yeah, 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 with the under okay. Dominic. No, I was going to say as brilliant as Luis Enrique was against Real Sociedad with his tactical plan that worked really well. Dembele as a force nine, etc. There's this feeling in Paris that he's trying to take the make a little bit during his press conferences <laughs> how he answers some questions which they don't like. And it's three draws in a row. They still have 10 points clear. They're going to win the league. It's not a problem. But on one hand, BS lines like, let's, it depends on the sun. Uh, the line also, which we discussed last week about we need to get used to playing without Kylian. Mm, yeah. Which we say all the time, okay, that's that's... That's great, but next season it will be a different squad. Yeah. So you're now playing with players that might not even be there next season either outside of Kylian. And you will have new signings, new players that you don't know, you won't be able to play with them until they sign. Like a Noziman or Rafael Leo or anybody else they might sign. Do you think this is uh, Luis Enrique's decision or is it a, a kind of club? Has it come from a little bit higher up? So I think he hates stars anyway. Right. I mean, when he was the uh, yeah, he, he, head coach. He dropped Totti. At yeah, of course, he dropped Messi, he dropped Totti. So he had clashed with Messi, clashed with Totti. He was the big star when he was the head coach of Spain. Ramos. So I think, we use Ramos as well. Yeah, he stopped Ramos calling him. Well. Yeah. yeah. And I think he wants to be the big guy. And for that, if Kylian is not there, he's better. What is really strange, for example, is that Ethan Mbappe used to play, made his debut, and as soon as Kylian announced that he was leaving, we don't see him at all in the first team squad anymore. He still trains with them, but he's not on the team sheets anymore at all, mm. uh, which seems also a bit like, okay, let's just punish the whole family by not having the younger brother in the squad and then Kylian on the bench most of the time. So 
I don't know, we'll see. He will be back for the big Champions League matches, of course. He'll be back for the Marseille game. He'll be back for the big games. But for a game like this, where a lot of starters were rested or benched, Donnarumma, Dembele, etc., he was also benched. OK. Tell us about why Lens Brest was so good. It was just, I thought, very intense. There was only one goal and not many chances, to be fair. The XG is on the one for both. But you could feel the tension. Lens needed to win to come back. And now we've got... Six points between second and six is the, the shortest um, gap we've had Ooh. in more than 10 years. So the title is gone, but between second and six is going to be it's, quite yeah. exciting. Nice's form has really tailed off. Yeah, massively for your boy Fayoli. Oh Just boy. behind sixth place Nice, only one point further down. Who is it? Why? Marseille under that Jean-Louis Gasset, who Incredible. now won one, two, three, four, Sleepy five Joe Biden. Wins. Joe Biden. Sleepy <laughs> Joe Gasset. Don't sleep on him. Yep. Five wins out of five. Latest victory being a 2-0 against Nantes on Sunday night. And this follows that remarkable performance on Thursday in the Europa League when they once again sent uh, Marcelino packing yeah. and his Villarreal boys. Incredible 4-0 win. To be fair, it could have been more even. They were outstanding. Mm. And Villarreal were disappointing. But Marseille was just crazy. They played five games, they were the five wins, in 18 days. So last night, on, on Sunday night against Nantes, they were tired. It was not as brilliant. Aubameyang scored two goals and now he's on fire as his, well. Yeah, his celebration for the Incredible. second as well. Yeah. At his age. At his age, you're he's right. He's 35 in June, by the way. Yeah, he, yeah, did, yeah. A, yeah. he did the forward flip. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. if you haven't seen the one of the two against Villarreal, the chip with his left foot, oh, that, that's even incredible. KDB tried against Liverpool and could not do. Yeah. Aubameyang did. Now, to be fair, the second leg against Villarreal is, is done now. Even away in Spain, I don't think they can come back. But then after that, it's Rennes away, PSG at home, Lille away, and Nice at home. So it will get much tougher now for him after f the five games that he had and that he won, but still brilliant. And it's really good, obviously, to have Marseille there. Is there something that Gasset has done? Because a lot of people regarded his appointment with a certain amount of yeah. confusion. But w what has he actually done that's made A lot of love. Yeah, yeah they, do, they, they do games. They like his accent. They like his voice. He's very like your does, what does grandfather. He sound like? So it's a South of France accent. Oh, yeah. A very singing accent. But they're in Marseille. Is that not all over the place? No, because he's from Montpellier, so he's slightly different. Okay. But he's still very warm. He's a very warm guy anyway. Oh, nice. Okay. So it's like your grandfather who you go to on holidays and you just love those two weeks more than anything else in the year kind of mm. thing. And that's, that's very much that. And it's not a big... he's not Catuzo as well. No, but Reno was, I think, has qualities, I guess. But warmth is not really in the sense that... Right. Warmth yeah, yeah. for him is slapping yeah. you in the face and saying... Si ragazzi. Yeah, grabbing you by the yeah, throat. Exactly, yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, Gasset is more like, come here, I'll give you a hug. I've made he, some cookies. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Come and eat some cookies. Teddy, <laughs> Teddy Vera. On the sofa. What are, what are you watching <laughs> antique show? <laughs> 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 so that is it. And I think for people like Aubameyang, Ismail Assar, who is reborn, right. it works better than the slap in the face from the Italian. Right? Oh, okay. Worked really well with those Ivory Coast players. Yeah. 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 yeah but that is it's like... nice for him that he's yeah. bounced back so swiftly and uh, for Marseille as well. Uh, uh, let's talk about Eden Hazard going back to Lille and the special day they made for him. Yes, yeah, special day. They've got a, a pitch call after him, mm. uh, which is lovely, at the training grounds. Mm. Where he won the title. Where he won the title. So, uh, someone said something really clever the other day on French television. So the stadium is called after the former mayor of Lille oui. who never liked football. What's it called, James? Oh, wait, Mill Stadium. Uh, <laughs> nah, no, you remember. won't know, but... What's it called? Stade Moua. I am. So he didn't like football, and they named the stadium after him. That right. they, na they named a pitch at the training ground for Hazard, who didn't like training, <laughs> which I think is quite <laughs> funny in itself. But Eden was really happy. They've done a, a long interview that you can find on their website. Everywhere. It's in French, but you can find translation, where he's really, he's really opened and... and as always, really great fun. pictures of him having the uh, the new Eden Hazard burgers that they as well, served up. The burgers. I mean, I think he's. If you ask me now, he's just retired, so it's a bit right. too early to see. But he can go down the route of Thierry Henry, who who oh. James saw recently, right. <laughs> or, or Philippe Mexes, or, or Philippe Mexes, <laughs> Samuel <laughs> Nasri, Ronaldo. I mean, there's a few. Adriano. Adriano. 
where everything that you didn't get, although Eden got it when he was still a player, yeah. uh, but you still get it more than once you retire. And he would enjoy MasterChef and everything, which is his favorite TV program. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, he loves cooking. So nice he loves happy. his wife's cooking and he loves MasterChef. Mm. But it was great. And he said, like, listen, Lille was the perfect club for me to start. It was a club where down the road from basically where he was born and grew up in Belgium, just mm. across the border. And he said, when they basically, basically let me do what I wanted. So they said, like, like what? He said, well, you know, at training, all I wanted to do is not make people. And sometimes that doesn't go down well with a senior player. But in Lille, they knew I was part of the family. They were good to me. So they let me do my thing. And it was, it was it's just a brilliant interview and, and a great tribute, I think, they made to him. Lovely. We were right to go top with uh, Ligue 1, weren't we? That was my yeah. accent. Yeah, right. Thank you. Uh, now, you mentioned Marseille's 4-0 victory over Villarreal. They weren't the only ones with a 4-0 win on Thursday. Yeah. Uh, Roma, of course, the other side to uh, notch up that scoreline in their home clash with, with Brighton. So what's going to happen this week? Well, early on Thursday, Slavia Prague take on Milan. The Rossoneri are 4-2 up from the first leg. Rangers host Benfica. It's 2-2 in that game. Uh, Villarreal against Marseille, of course. And West Ham, who trail by a goal as they entertain Freiburg. In the evening, Atalanta Sporting, which is 2-2 after the first leg. Same scoreline for Leverkusen and Karabakh. Remarkable game there. Remarkable oh. goals as Remarkable well. Remarkable goals as well. Unbelievable. The first one from Karabakh. I don't know if he meant it, but the way he... He did a little kind of bouncing bomb kind of roll over the keeper. Yeah, yeah that, that, that was the second one, I think. Right? Was that the second one? Okay. Yeah. Second one, Juninho. Yeah, 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 yeah. Juninho, yeah, yeah, yeah. Lovely one. And, and Florian Wirt scored and as well. Yeah. Florian Wirt yeah. scored. But even with that, it looked like Leverkusen, who hadn't been beaten the entire season, were going to lose that incredible run away in Baku. But then at the last kick of the game, what was it, 95th yeah. minute, yeah. they finally got that equaliser. Anyway... 2-2 the score from the first leg. Catch up with what happens this Thursday as Karabag travel the many, many kilometres. <laughs> 3,000? How many? About that. Yeah. To Leverkusen. Liverpool will be entertaining Sparta Prague, comfortable with a 5-1 first leg lead. And Brighton take on Roma. Highlights course with myself. I think it's um, I think it's Rory Smith and Michael Owen, although not necessarily in that order. Yeah, yeah. We together for the Champions you League. You and I will be doing the on Champions Wednesday. League yeah, one right. on Wednesday. I look forward to that, Jules. Yeah. Oh, and there's also Conference League action, which includes Aston Villa Ajax. How did Ajax do this weekend, Jules? Uh, they won this weekend, didn't they? No, they drew two. No, two. Well, hang on, Jordan Henderson. What's going on here? Still one, only one win. That I first guess, leg. I guess he didn't run around or shout enough. No, yeah, yeah mentality. Yeah. It's about mentality. Mm. Be fascinating to see, fascinating to see what happens when Ajax visit Villa, who, of course, didn't have a great weekend at the hands of Spurs. But, um, no, I wanted to ask about Roma Brighton because 4 0 looks a bit done and dusted. But what a night! You were there at the Olympico, James. I was. It's magnificent, James. Not just because Philippe Mexis was there. Mm. But uh, even the first 10 minutes, it was so helter-skelter. There was lots of chances for both teams. Brighton had a shot that was deflected. It hit the post. We saw Svila make that great save from uh, mm. Danny Welbeck as well. Di Rossi, one of the things that's distinguished him in his brief time as coach, he's very honest. And he'll basically say, we played terrible in the first halves of games against Fiorentina, Torino, uh, Frosinone. And he, after the game, said, I don't think the scoreline reflected how the game went. He, mm. think, he thought that Brighton should maybe have scored and just Roma were a little bit more clinical. And, I mean, De Zerbi afterwards cut a completely different uh, figure in that he was saying, you could just tell from the warm-up that the players were intimidated. They were taking one touch, an extra touch in the warm-up. And I could see, okay, these players have not really been experienced in this environment before, right. even Which... though they played away in Marseille, Ajax, yeah. uh, in Amsterdam. And then he... You guys had touched on this, I think, a little bit last week about the difference in, in, in levels of, of European experience. And he certainly wheeled that out. We're not ready for this level of competition, which I was a little bit disappointed in. But sorry, do go on. It's like Doff as well, the owner. I don't, I don't yeah. know if you were going to mm. say that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that was very surprising. Mm. But also, like, it was a bit weird. We were pitch side pre-game and he was due to come out and speak to TNT. Mm. And he didn't. Oh, uh, he like basically came out of the tunnel and then thought twice about it. Ooh. And I think that was maybe because our position was right in front of the Kudvasud. Ah. And oh, really? Yes. Were you getting any grief? 
I wasn't. Okay, no, you were. <laughs> 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 oh, castle, 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 castle. You stand in front of a packed cordova of ultras, and you're likely to get the odd comment. Exactly. So, um, but I, d I think uh, for him, I think he, the reason he didn't do it, I don't know exactly, but I think subsequently what he came out with about seeing something in the warm up he didn't like, right, made him okay. I need to think about something to say to my players about this. Um, but yeah, I mean, as Jules says, curious to hear him sort of call out uh, Tony Bloom. Massively. Um, so, and, so. you know, De Zerbi, as much as he is a genuine innovator, Daniel De Rossi, after, yeah, before the game, called him a genius and all mm. this sort of thing. Uh, he's known for being a bit high maintenance yeah. right. and this sort of thing. And so, so his Brighton side need to put four past Roma this Thursday. Yeah. To be fair, Fiorentina could have put four past Roma in the, the, the first half of their clash Sunday night. Fiorentina were also involved in a high-scoring game last Thursday. The remarkable 4-3 with Maccabi Haifa, which took place in Budapest. You, you'll have missed this because you were in, mm. in, in Rome, but it was just an extraordinary game. Fiorentina coming back again and again from behind to eventually take the game uh, in a yeah. seven-goal thriller. So all the Italian sides in the second and third tier competition scoring four goals. Well, apart from Atalanta, who yeah. played oh, on the, the Wednesday. One -one. But yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Milan did as well. Woodworth three times, didn't they? So uh, Atalanta, Atalanta yeah. yeah, they could have easily scored four. But, um, but yeah, so Fiorentina against Roma ended up a 2-2 draw. Mm. A very entertaining game Sunday night. Yeah. What, does it tell us anything that could be useful for Brighton on Thursday? Not really. I think Roma were a little bit tired after Thursday's game. I think, from what I can tell, De Rossi has been putting his players through double, triple sessions. And so you can see, for example, Dybala mm. is playing a lot more, a lot longer than we've grown accustomed to him over the last few years. Um, and I think that's because of the kind of fitness and conditioning work that they're doing um, behind the scenes at, at Roma. And yeah, De Rossi, I think he will say that the two coaches he learned the most from as uh, a player were Spalletti, because he had him over two spells, and Luis Enrique. Mm. Um, but I think the other one is Conte. Conte went at Euro 2016. And I think that whole, having a very short space of time to get your team players ready He's he's leaned on that quite a lot. So they looked a little bit tired on on um, Sunday, but they came back in that game. Mm. They probably had no right to come back in it because Fiorentina played ex extremely well in the first half. They also had a penalty, which is still a man of the moment. Yeah, saved. again, which is one of De Rossi's big decisions, and he's really sort of rewarded De Rossi for going with him, but stops that penalty. And this was maybe going to be an, another candidate for moment of the week. Mm. Was Fiorentina's just terrible record with penalties they've missed five of six um, no this year they would be uh, firmly in the kind of well they would be a lot closer to the Europa League maybe even Champions League places if they were putting these penalties away they keep changing the penalty taker because <laughs> no sooner does one miss one than they lose confidence and have to go again so Biragi missed one at the weekend before it would be Nico Gonzalez some of the other strikers have, 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 um, have obviously taken them and missed them so yeah Fiorentina were good but I think that the other thing that was very impressive about Roma in that game and very impressive from De Rossi was that he recognised that playing a back three uh, in the first half wasn't working changed to a back four second mm. half in the second half, Roma had 68% possession and usually Fiorentina are a team that absolutely dominate the ball against everyone. Um, so, yeah. So even if Brighton start the game well, there's a chance that De Rossi will react, which you, you're not sure you could say the same about De Zerbi. Anyway, that game coming up on Thursday. Roma, meanwhile, closing the gap on Bologna and the top four. They're now just three points behind Bologna, as we've heard, beaten by Inter on Saturday. Should mention, actually, before we leave Fiorentina, Roma, whew, what a what an equaliser by Diego Lorente out of Leeds. <laughs> wow. Yeah, and I think Leeds fans will laugh at this, but uh, De Rossi, after the game, said, Diego is wasted <laughs> on the centre-back position because he's got so much ability, so much skill, and you saw it in that finish that he could play higher up the pitch, which I think... <laughs> he's a bit of a soft defender, but he's good on the ball. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Uh, elsewhere in Serie A, just moving on to Italy's top division, Inter, of course, miles clear. Second place is now Milan. They've finally overtaken Juve after Juve got held 2-2 by Atalanta and Milan beat Empoli 
1-0. The Juve Atlanta game, curiously, Juve's big summer target, Cope Miners, the guy with the brace. Cop Miners, rather. Yep. The uh, cooperative. Mm. Um, <laughs> like we see at Atlanta. But yeah, Cop Miners has had a fantastic season. Um, turn of the year, he scored in six consecutive games. He is also their penalty taker. But um, yeah, scored the opener, then scored the equaliser. Uh, their first goal was a kind of lovely free yeah. kick, uh, well worked free kick, yeah. and brilliant finish uh, from Cup Miners. But he's a tutto campista, you know, you can play everywhere. You know, I think uh, when he joined Atalanta, there were times when he would go in and play centre back. Um, he was supposed to be just kind of a, a number eight when he joined, but um, Gasper said, Look, I can play him as a six in front of the defence, I can play him further forward. And I think both of their midfielders will have a lot of attention. In fact, they, I, I know they already have a lot of interest this summer in Cup Miners, but also Edison, okay. the midfield player there. Edison's had a fantastic season. Um, and yeah, if Atalanta want to do another Rasmus Hoyland in sell player for a big profit, I think they can quite easily do it with one of those two. Okay. Uh, also in Serie A this weekend, Cagliari. Woo-hoo. Two straight wins. They're unbeaten now in four. They beat Salernitana, bottom of the table, Salernitana, 4-2 this weekend. They are now four places clear, Claudio Ranieri's side of the bottom three. And what a goal by Motta. Yeah, Danny Motta. Danny Motta in the Genoa clash with the remarkable Monza. Yeah, Monza, who, aside from losing that game to Roma, 4-1, yeah. of, I think that's their one defeat in maybe six games. Beat Milan in that run? Beat Milan 4-2. Daniel Maldini keeps scoring. That's true. Yeah, he uh, got the uh, the last goal in this because Genoa came back. But the Motta goal, yeah. extraordinary. In the house of Quagliarella. <laughs> yeah. None more Quag goal. Yeah, wonderful scissor kick from a, a mm. corner. Uh, great connection. I mean, Danny Motta used to be like an under-21 player for Portugal. He was at Juventus uh, when Cristiano was there, trained with Cristiano. Uh, he's a lovely kid. I've interviewed him once. He's like really kind of bubbly, uh, bubbly character. Um, but yeah, Monza, I mean, that is probably one of the goals of the season, mm. along with Leal. Anywhere. Yeah, Anywhere. yeah Leal yeah. the other week. Also, Marcus Turam in the, in the Milan derby. Yeah, but th- for me, better than Garnacho. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Mm. All right. Nice. Uh, James Horncastle, celebrity friends. Your chat with Zlatan last week. Uh, it seems to be every week I walked and talked with Zlatan. Yeah. Yeah. Walk with me, Zlatan. You said. Well, I think Zlatan. who said, "Can I walk with you, James?" And well, James that's said, yeah. Yeah, if you want yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Who else this week? I like Did Z. you say anything interesting? Uh, we well, you know, we just. Oh, okay. He Sorry, I don't clothes. mean to. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. secrets here. All right. You know. All right. What about your trip to Coma then? To to. to oh yeah. Yeah. Who did yeah. you meet there? Sesk Thierry. Uh, I met Thierry at CBS Studios. Okay, in London. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Thierry was fantastic. Was really? He? Yeah, great. He put his hand on your knee. <laughs> <laughs> no, Big Meeks came over though. Okay. Uh, we reminisced about the European football show. The what? I remember that show on BT Sport on Sunday nights, which oh, yeah. uh, mm. got cancelled. Oh, yeah. But I went to see Big Meeks for a feature that we ran one okay. time when he was, was living in Luca Toni's flat overlooking Ponte Vecchio. Right. Note to listener, he means Micah Richards. Um, so we were, because Thierry, even though I th- they both spent one year each in Italy, mm. um, and Thierry's Italian, I would say, is. I mean, I think he likes to make Mike yeah. think that Mike is Italian is not as good as his. Well, Cherry speaks French, uh, yeah. as you know. Yeah. And it's a much easier yeah, jump sure. from growing up in France to yeah. Yeah, yeah. than growing up in yeah. 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 That's Leeds. That says he, he's yeah. a cultured man because when he moved to Spain in two weeks, he was speaking Spanish too. Again, much the same yeah. language. Yeah. <laughs> French Similarities. And Different hand gestures. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. That's okay. pretty much the size of it. <laughs> yeah. No, I, um, there's some, okay, so with Como, obviously, yeah. um, Cés Fabregas and Thierry have a stake in the club, mm. okay? Um, and then you've got some players who've been playing in Serie A for a long time. So I got to talk to Simone Verdi. Mm. Simone Verdi, who Napoli once paid 25 million for, scores great free kicks with his right and his left foot. Patrick Cutrone, local boy, grew up in Como. And uh, and then there's a there's a group of players who've been with them since they were in the fifth and fourth division. 
who've like come up and I mean classic Horncastle curse they lost at the weekend they are in the promotion places um, so yeah it was it was a nice lovely day like um, I mean the, the stadium like all stadiums apart from Juventus and Udinese's is old but it's right on the lake yeah and it's um, a beautiful uh, setting to watch football gorgeous yeah gorgeous all right that's probably enough of City B yeah uh, <laughs> elsewhere in La Liga let's hear some more stories from Alvaro next Real Madrid, what they do with without Jude Bellingham this weekend, Alvaro? They needed a goldfist, and they got the goldfist, even though I think that it wasn't too satisfying because the second goal came uh, like in the 80th minute. Mm. So against Leipzig, Real Madrid was defensive, and the Bernabeu didn't like it. Mm. And this time it looked like the game was going to be another uh, one of those uh, good results that wasn't too satisfactory, but at the end they won 4 0, and probably the biggest. Um, the biggest uh, treat of all was uh, Arda Guller's mm. goal, uh, pretty much at the end of the game, when he round past uh, the goalkeeper and then he, he scored from an acute angle. And that was probably the story of the day and the story of Sunday, because Arda Guller needed the goal for Real Madrid. He arrived last summer, hadn't scored for Real Madrid yet. And uh, every player uh, in the Real Madrid camp know about his quality, his ability, the way they hack him after he scored is the way you hack a player that you know that is special. They and hacked yeah. his laptop, his... his, his, his hugged him, James. Hugged him, oh, I'm sorry. I thought I... <laughs> <laughs> How much trouble are Celta Vigo in? The two points clear of Cadiz after they managed to get the win against the other Madrid side. Yeah, it was very inconvenient for Celta that Cadiz won. Uh, I think that they weren't counting on an Atletico to have a, such a bad uh, afternoon. Mm. Um, They're two points clear of the drop. It's Celta. It's two mm. points clear of the yeah of the drop there. Um, I mm. think they are in trouble. Yeah, they are right. in trouble. It looked like at some point that the Andalusian uh, sides were doomed because it's Almeria, Cadiz, and uh, Granada are the, the bottom three, and they've been there for about ten weeks already. Right. Uh, but yeah, Celta is not uh, doing favors to what's to, happened. To like himself. is Iago Aspas not scoring goals anymore? Uh, uh, well, he, he's not scoring many. He's okay. definitely, definitely not hitting double figures this season. And also, I think that the problem is that in defense they are very soft, mm. uh, very soft. Then uh, in midfield they have suffered with the injury of Renato Tapia, who is back finally. And then up front. I think that they are not playing uh, full gas ever because they know that they concede many. So at some point they tend to be speculative in the games and they don't defend very well. So when they stay back and they try to defend in their own box and all that, they don't know how to do that. But at the same time, they know that they have to do that yeah. if they want to keep on getting points. So for Celta it's a little bit difficult because Rafa Milites naturally would like to defend and at the same time... Celta's best weapons are up front. Mm. So, you know, I think that Rafa is still trying to adjust all that. Okay. Yeah, they're a better team than the position in the league, really. They oh, should yeah. Be, they should be doing They've been very unlucky. They lost many points, like, in the last uh, 10, 15 minutes of the game. It's right the opposite of uh, Inter that I was saying before. They haven't considered in the, any goal in the Serie A in the last 14 minutes of each game. With Celta, they have considered so many games in a stoppage time this season. Mm. I once had a lovely meal in Cadiz. And El Faro. El Faro. <laughs> what, what did you got? Pesca, pescaito frito, maybe? No, no, I had the arroz con negro, el, el negro de sepia. <sighs> nice. Buenísimo. Yeah, was... with, with the ink, right? And all that. Yeah, 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 yeah. very much so. Very Lovely. Much so. I had a good meal in Rome. Uh, so many people. You, what did you eat in Rome, James? I tripe? went to a very trattoria romana. Ah, uh, yeah. Tripe. Was it an artichoke? <laughs> I had, uh, what was it, spaghetto con animelli e poro, which is like sweetbreads and... Uh, Leek? Uh, it's good. Sweetbreads. Mm. Mm. It's very good. And a really good polpette from mm. uh, Teresa. Teresa, the um, proprietor. Nice. It's been All right. there 40 years. If you're in the... Which quartier was it? This was... Uh, so it's on Via, Via Pellegrino. So Cesare Al Pellegrino is the restaurant. And it is um, not too far away from Via del Governo Vecchio, so Piazza Navona. Oh, right, okay. Uh, it's in one of the like old streets. I mean, old streets. They're all old streets. They're all old streets. <laughs> <laughs> one old street. Yeah. 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 Great place. All righty. Check it out if you're in the Eternal Piazza City. Navona area. <laughs> and feeling package. Or Centro Storico. Yeah. Centro Storico. Yeah. Oh, have Almeria won a match yet? No. no. Tonight. Uh, they are playing tonight they're against Sevilla. Monday night, yeah. Will they see Cadiz win and think? Maybe they get inspiration. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Big look could Derby that then? <laughs> not really. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I think that uh, 
Spanish. Well, Italy, yes. any Sevilla fan that the game against Almeria is a big derby, they, they feel insulted, <laughs> really. <laughs> Spanish <laughs> team plays <laughs> Spanish <laughs> team. <laughs> big <laughs> derby. Spanish geography <laughs> from, <laughs> from GCSE. Where is Almeria then? Almeria, uh, you know the many movies from this guy, uh, uh, what is his name? Uh, Sergio Al Leone. Yes. Uh, the Far yes. West movies where, yeah. uh, where, uh, where done so in Almeria. So, yeah, yeah, it's in the south uh, east of the country, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but... Andalusia, but Andalu Andalusia, is, Andalusia is probably bigger than some European countries. And uh, the distance between Andalusia, Sevilla, right. Malaga, Huelva is massive. I mean, I so was being slightly cheeky when I thought it a big, yeah. Yeah. Only big 400, derby. Only 400, 400 kilometers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's not back. Here, probably Andalusia is bigger than Austria or countries like this. <laughs> okay, this is pure I speculation, mean, but it's really okay. big. 400 kilometers, why is that? Right. Is that London to Manchester? Yeah, <laughs> to be honest, well, James, it is in Andalusia. It was 400 kilometers away. That, like, like, no, 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 no Jimbo, Jimbo, you're, you're yeah. absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, and it's a regional derby, <laughs> uh, Almeria, Sevilla, <laughs> but an Almeria didn't. Derby. Derby. <laughs> but Sevilla couldn't okay. care less. Jules has got his phone up and he's literally showing me the way to Almeria. <laughs> <laughs> How many kilometers? How far is it? 400. There you go. <laughs> it's a little it's uh, a th pop reference. Uh, yeah. uh, yeah. Yeah. That's okay. enough. That's enough Liga. Or Sevi is it? Sevilla Betis is the big okay. derby. Yeah, no. I in mean, Andalusia, that. that's it. I no. know that. I've uh, lived in Seville for a bit. Yeah. Yeah, I spent um, a month. Well, I, I was there for a month, actually. Yeah, I mean, lived in. I spent a month in Seville, so. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, good times. <laughs> yeah. Good times. No, lovely city. Yeah. Uh, ooh, uh, next up, what's this? Rafa on the line from Venice. Wink, wink, listener. <laughs> Rafa, uh, well, first of all, how about a moment of the weekend? James, you'd be surprised to hear that I really struggled for a moment of the weekend because we had so many big moments this weekend, big goals, mm. big changes that might impact the title race and Champions League positions. But I think my favourite is probably the Donny Marlin goal for Dortmund. It's a sort of an auto overhead kick so he, he puts the ball up himself and then hits it overhead through the goalkeeper's legs from a tight angle to give Dortmund the lead against Werder Bremen they won the game with one man down and it felt like a very big game in the title uh, sorry in the race for the top four to keep Leipzig at bay and also came a good time because Dortmund have this PSV Eindhoven second leg coming up and really needed uh, a bit of a convincing performance mm, indeed they do they also got a good goal from Jaden Sancho. Yes, his first one since coming back. Um, didn't have his best game overall, but is showing signs of improvement. Looks busy and the goal was very beautiful. Uh, went through on the left side, cut back inside and then found the goal with a shot uh, near the, the first post. And uh, it was important because, as I said, with Dortmund then going down one man for the second uh, 45 minutes and holding out, conceding one goal, but then holding out with nine men. It was, it was very impressive in the end, at least in Excellent terms stuff. of resilience. Mm. So Wednesday they take on PSV and it's 1-1 from the first leg, but this is back at the Signal Duna Park. Yes, and Dortmund will be favourites because, as you are uh, well aware, they've done really well in the Champions League. Uh, something seems to switch with them. They play with more focus. They play with more cohesion. They tend to be very efficient. They are defensively somehow more solid. And uh, the first leg was not entirely brilliant, but they had their moments and they got a draw, which is a reasonable result. And of course, they feel that they have every chance to put things right and go through to the next round And when they get the chance in the second leg. And I think on, on the balance of their last couple of games where they had that win against Union Berlin and they had the win against Werder Bremen. I think there are signs that at least in terms of the attitude and the sort of application, this Dortmund team is making progress. Can they still play better with the ball? Definitely. But I think PSV and their style of play will, will afford them a lot of chances um, to play in the break, even though they're playing at home. And I think they will exploit that. So I expect them to go through. Very good. If it's making improvements you're after, how about that FC Bayern Munich? <laughs> after the 3-0 win against Lazio last midweek, this weekend, an 8-1 victory against Mainz. Yeah, normal business has been resumed. I mean, Mainz, it has to be said, are the opposite of a bogey team for Bayern. They're their favourite team in recent years. They concede 
lots and lots of goals in Munich for some reason. And Saturday was the same story. Sort of fairly cagey beginning, but then the floodgates really opened up in the second half. And yeah, Bayern were, were too good. Thomas Müller was in fine form again. And of course, that man, Harry Kane, with a perfect hat-trick. Perfect. Why, James? Because one with his left foot, one with his right, and one header. So it doesn't really get better than that. 30 goals now for him. Just a 12 more to break the all-time record. So, OK, now this is an interesting thing. He's on 1.2 per game, I think, which means that he's on course to equal uh, Lewandowski's record. Is that correct? Lewandowski at this point of the season, by the way, I'm told, had six goals more. Your maths is correct, James. Nice. Uh, the amazing thing with Lewandowski is that he managed to beat the record of Gerd Müller when he, I think, only played 29 games. So right. with Harry Kane having not missed a single game yet, you'd expect him to A, be further ahead, but also maybe to go all the way regardless. And I think we'll be having a clear review next week because they're playing another side that Bayern should do pretty well against. Uh, it's Darmstadt. What was the result last, uh, last time they played each other? Just the 8-0 for Bayern. 8-0. So wow. I think Harry Kane will enjoy that one. Also worth mentioning from that 8-1 victory this weekend, Kane's pass for Muziala's goal, which was uh, delicious. And the Gnabry back heel was pretty amazing as well. Great goals, great moments all along. And Harry Kane described that assist as his best ever, Ooh. you know, which is um, pretty high praise, even though it is uh, self-praise, uh, considering how many fine assists he has already provided in his career. But yeah, the, the Gnabry one was special as well. Uh, improvised um, sort of volley back heel uh, on the turn. Very hard to emulate, uh, very hard, I think, to pull off again, but it somehow worked. And it's really good to see him because he's had such a long time out. And I think with the Euros coming up and uh, Bayern really needing, I think, that extra bit of push that can come from the bench when he's around and Coman is there, it's... It's high time we, we see Serge Gnabry in action again. OK. Raf, is there any particular reason why, beyond their opposition, that Bayern have suddenly had this return to big wins? I think the opposition that definitely helped. Um, Lazio were pretty poor and Mainz played into Bayern's hands by being very, very open and leaving lots of space. And this Bayern team, as we know, they thrive on space. Uh, when you make it difficult for them, when you defend deep and compact, they really struggle. But Mainz did the opposite and Bayern played through them uh, with real relish. And I think it probably isn't quite a true reflection of where they are. But it is, I think, noticeable that their composure, that their confidence has come back. Uh, they look a lot happier. The front players are all scoring goals defensively, even though I, I, I never thought I would see this or I might say this even. Um, the combination of De Ligt and Dyer seems to be the winning one. Uh, at least at this moment in time. Uh, Min Jae Kim and Upa Mekano both out and De Ligt and Dyer being preferred um, and being referred to as the half-brothers, uh, jokingly, by uh, Joshua Kimmich because they look look fairly alike. But they somehow seem to have found an understanding that, that has eluded this Bayern defence in, in recent weeks and months. And, yeah, Bayern, Bayern have been happy, um, albeit... Uh, uh, with one Wermutstropfen, as we say, uh, one drop of, uh, of bitter medicine, uh, poor Alfonso Davis lost two teeth in a, in a collision uh, on the pitch and uh, I'm sure would have seen plenty of the dentists in recent days. The other a drop of uh, Wermutstropfen. <laughs> Was that it? Wermut. I think it's Weymouth. Wermut. Oh, like Vermouth, Vermouth yeah. Struten. Well, the other bit of that was is the fact, of course, that they remain 10 points behind by a Leverkusen, who were 2-0 winners against Wolfsburg this weekend. That makes it 36 games unbeaten and was pretty impressive. But I kind of almost want to ask you more about game number 35 in that run, which was the remarkable match away in Baku against Karabag last Thursday. Just when you thought they travelled six hours to find the one banana skin that can derail their season or at least finish their record, they somehow bounced back and, and equalised late on to keep their 
der Record Alive. And uh, here's another German phrase for you. Der weiße Weste. Der white vest. So it's the idea is it's a spotless. Um, oh. And they're still, still very much spotless. Uh, and as you said, the regulation went against uh, Wolfsburg. They were never really in any trouble. Um, Jens was sent off in the 28th minute for Wolfsburg. So it made things easy for Bayer. But they scored a beautiful goal. Well, two beautiful goals. But one especially so from Florian Wirtz. But the, teller from, the, the header from Nathan Teller was also pretty cool. And they, they never looked like one second as if they might not, uh, not win the game or, or even lose it. So, yeah, uh, anything that Müller has been saying recently about, you know, maybe Leverkusen will get unlucky somehow or, you know, maybe we'll somehow find a way of getting back. I mean, Leverkusen don't look like a team that care don't look like a team that really suffer from any low self-esteem at this point. And I think that it's probably too late for Bayern, even though they have a, a bit of momentum at this point. OK, you've got Dortmund favourites to go through against PSV. I imagine you favour Bayer Leverkusen at home to Karabag. And what about Freiburg's hopes as they travel to West Ham with a one-goal lead from the first leg? I'm more optimistic now after the first leg. I thought Freiburg would probably get knocked out by West Ham. And of course, that can still happen. But it was a good win. Um, they haven't always done so well in, in knockouts against these type of opposition. But they've given, given themselves a real chance. So I would say now there's slight favourites to go through. But yeah, it's still going to be very, very close. And West Ham at home will, will have chances. Magnificent. Rafa, enjoy Venice. We'll see you next week. Thank you, James. All right, that was Rafa, eh? Did yeah. we all enjoy that? Lovely. Very nice. Really, yeah. like, he was Glad. really focused and his moment of the weekend was <laughs> once again... Knocked it out of the park. Yeah. <laughs> well researched. Which, if you do in Venice, you're going to end up in the lagoon, won't you? You are. <laughs> yeah. in, the, the, in Italian, one of the things for dribbling is uh, Veneziana. Oh, yeah. Because, like, you have to be good at dribbling to keep it out of the water, out of the canal. Is that what they, they, they mean, do you think? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's one of the things. I mean, you can also get pastry, which is a Veneziana as well, no? Is... Yeah, OK. Mm. Hey, anyway, that's it for today's Totally Football Show. I hope you enjoyed it, listener. Of course, we'll be back next Tuesday. Maybe we'll all be together, perhaps. Uh, in the meantime, Thursday, well, Wednesday night, Jules, you and I will yep. do Champions League highlights. Do join us. Uh, and then Thursday, we'll be back with our reaction to the Champions League games, etc. For now... Many thanks to Jules, Alvaro, James and producer Charlie, a new listener. And we'll be back with you soon. The Totally Football Show podcast is available three times a week, bringing you all the football news you could reasonably be expected to care about. We've got views, we've got stats, we've got analysis, we've got some of the best football writers around and the whole thing is absolutely free. So have a listen on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or all the usual places by clicking on the link below.